welcome back to Discipleship Class. Hey, we had a couple week break. It was not too bad. Not too bad. But now it's time to get back into it. We are now going to start a session like, well, kind of like our last session, we were talking about praying without fear. Mm -hmm. This session, we're going to be talking about praying for a relationship. Man, we got a lot to talk about. It's going to be fun. So come with us on this journey. At first, we're going to get started with a word of prayer, and then we're going to get started. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the ability to pray, to just speak to you. We thank you. Be with us as we talk about prayer to have a stronger relationship with you. And uh, just have the Holy Spirit, Spirit work through us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So welcome back. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy how much Bible we like talking about. Okay. Uh, we we want to stand on the Bible. This is God's truth. So as we begin today talking about praying for relationship, we first want to jump into the Gospel of Mark. So we're going to be looking at chapter 1, verse 35 through 37, and we'll have it on the screen for you if you don't have your Bible with you. And it reads, And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. Now, if you don't know who we're talking about, we're talking about Jesus here. Jesus was praying and people were looking for him while he was praying. So now we're going to jump over to Luke chapter 5, verse 15 and 16. And it reads, But now even more, the report about him went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. So when we look at those two gospel accounts there, why do you think Jesus got up so early in the morning or headed off to lonely places to pray? Now, I know last video we, we talked about having that place that we can go and just be alone with the Father. And then when we pray, maybe this is what, what Jesus was doing. And we're going to talk about that in detail. But Jesus understood the challenge of people demanding his time. You have people that demand your time. <laughs> you know that, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the only chance Jesus had to spend quality time with the Father was when everyone else was still asleep, when he can isolate himself. So Jesus didn't waste time just laying down and just uh, sleeping like everyone else. He knew he needed to spend quality time with his Father in heaven. So you can be sure that Jesus would have valued that sleep time as much as we do. After all, he was in the flesh. He tired just as much as we tire. And yet he valued time with the Father even more. So you see, Jesus was willing to sacrifice even his rest to spend time with God. Yeah. So a few questions here just to get you thinking about this. Can you relate to Jesus' busyness? Hmm. Do you stay busy? I know we stay busy. <laughs> hey, here's a question. Do, do we stay too busy? Yes. Hmm. That's a good question. Too, too busy can keep us distracted uh, from spending that quality time. Second question here, can you relate to how others demanded so much of his time? So we know people heard of what Jesus was doing, the things he was teaching and preaching, the healings, the miracles. These people were pressing on him. Yeah. And you can just imagine, I mean, he did desire to have time alone. I mean, just like all of us want. I, I, I guess I can relate to a point, but... I mean, he is the Messiah, and he could do. Yeah, I can see why his time was really much demanded by. I'm not. I'm not famous enough to have a thousand people press me up against the side of a lake, but <laughs> that's that's a different uh, story. But last question here: How hard is it uh, for them to find quality time with God apart from distractions? So that 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 can be easily uh, found even with the apostles that they were distracted uh, and not even spending quality time in prayer. So, do you find it hard to relate to Jesus' disciples, uh, his discipline, I'm sorry, to get alone with his Father and talk, especially when at the very moment, inconvenient times or places? Why is that? So, we know Jesus, he showed discipline here again. He, he needed, not just wanted, but he needed that quality time with God. Mm -hmm. So, he was willing to sacrifice maybe an hour of sleep here and there, and that's when he could really uh, be just between them two without people distracting them. So 
Why do you think he was so compelled to spend time with the father? I mean, the answer to the question actually sounds kind of simple. But Jesus valued the time with the father because he valued the father. Mm. And I guess the question goes out to you, do you value the father? Mm. So when people are attracted to each other, right? When, when a guy and a girl are attracted to each other, they find time to spend with each other. You know, it doesn't matter how busy the day is or how long their to-do list is, they always find time to connect. Why is that? Mm. You know, that's, that's tough because, you know, if you want to think about it and, and, and like that, do you find time for the father that's a good question i think a good question that can you know convict all of us mm. that maybe we could spend a little bit more time so do you do they think and we're talking about the, the you know the boy and the girl you know do they think it's an inconvenience to have work to work their schedules in such a way to spend time together mm. To them, that's not an inconvenience. What are some extreme examples when you have made time to spend with someone you were dating? <laughs> you have an extreme, I have an extreme example. Oh. Yeah. What? <laughs> Man. Is this PG-13? Yes. I drove from Florida to Abilene, Texas in a day. That's a long drive. That is a lo it was 21 straight hours. Nice. So yes, that's an extreme example. That is. Yes. You got one? <laughs> um, I know I would go days without sleeping. If I wasn't at work or at, uh, or at school or practice, every, every second, uh, you know, I wanted to spend with that person. Yep, yep. So here's the next question. At what times are we most motivated to spend increased time with God? Oh, this is a hard question. But when, when do people most of the time find time to spend with God? Usually it's time that's left over. Time that's left over. If there is any. Right. How about a time of crisis? Mm. Something, something bad is something bad's happening. Time of confusion. Hmm? Not like that we're in that right now. No, no, <laughs> not at all. We're not confused. How about major decisions? <laughs> we're not in a time of a major decision right now. Or concern for others. You know, something, something bad going on with others. Mm -hmm. Someone needs to know that. Okay. So if these were the only times you spent with someone you cared for, right? What would the relationship be like and how long would it last? You know, the times that, you know, what we just talked about, these four, and I'm sure some of you guys can come up with more. Yeah. Crisis, confusion, decisions, and concern for others. Um, if these were the only times that you cared for, you know, that you spend with someone you cared for, what would that relationship be like? Well, that's a good question. That's, you know, that can be a convicting question too. Yeah. Mm, just, wow, I'll let you guys ponder on that one. So as we continue, and we're looking at relationships here, we know that relationships ultimately need to be built on the basis of enjoying each other, not just a desire to use the other person for our own purposes. Now, even if we look at love from the, the secular uh, viewpoint, um, a lot of people get together with relationships, not just intimate, but even friends, sometimes with conditions. There's a condition to most of those relationships. But as believers, that we now have Christ in us, we have God's love in us, we are to have relationships unconditionally. That we are to uh, have the same type of love that God has, which I know is sometimes can be very hard but um, we have the Holy Spirit to help us with that one. Yep. And that is uh, agape love. That is unconditional love. But now we want to turn our attention to Psalms 
uh, Psalm 37, uh, verse 3 through 6. And please listen to the words here carefully. It says, trust in the Lord and do good. That's tough sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Thank you, Lord. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. Wow. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Woo! Uh, there's a lot. You can hang that, that one on your refrigerator. That's a, nice, that's a good one. So when we look at that psalm there, just those few verses, what three directions are given in the psalm in order to experience joy in your relationship with God and effectiveness in life? So number one, and we'll have these on the screen for you, the first one here is to trust in the Lord and do good. Some of us do trust in the Lord and sometimes we do bad. <laughs> Luckily, God gives us grace for that. But we have to intentionally want to do good. Out of reverence of, of our love for God and that relationship, we should want to be more like Him and do good. Do you have anything to add to that? Oh, no, that, that's good stuff right there. I don't, <laughs> need to, I don't think you need to. <laughs> yeah, number two is delight yourself in the Lord. Delight. That's a word you don't really hear that much anymore. No. But you can just think the delight with the, the joy and the happiness there that, that God wants to instill in us. Well, that, that, that's no, that's something I can bring up. So, do you guys delight in praying? Mm. Hmm? Do you delight in what He says in His Word? Mm -hmm. That's a good point. The, this Psalm is perfect, right? You know, the perfect example. You know, you, I can delight myself. I, I can delight myself in that Psalm. Excellent. Yeah. So number three here, commit your way to the Lord. So I know the psalm here obviously is in the Old Testament. I hope you knew that. But now we live in the, in the New Testament era. Jesus tells us that we must take up our cross daily. So we are to commit ourselves to the Lord. This, it isn't just a, you know, I'm, I'm saved now. I can do whatever I want. You know, maybe, maybe God will bless me. Maybe He won't. We should look at these three. Trust in the Lord and do good. Delight yourself in the Lord and to commit your way to the Lord. God has your best interest in heart. God wants to hear from you. That's why we talk about prayer. We should have that relationship one-on-one -on -one with the Father. You should. And we should also value that time. Very much so. All right, next question. Why would prayer be less effective if any of these three approaches to God were missing? Mm -hmm. Good All question. Right. We just talked about the three. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the first one of the three without trusting God and acting on it. That's number one here. So without trusting God and acting in faith, our prayers lack conviction and faith. Mm. If there is a distrust in the goodness and faithfulness of God, then this relationship tension becomes a barrier to experiencing the life God has for us. Wow. Okay, so if there's a distrust in the goodness and faithfulness of God, well, I guess we need to uh, make sure we un that we trust in what He does for us is good. Yes. Because that's, man, that's, that's tough. That's a tough one right there. Mm -hmm. Okay, number two. Let's see if it gets any better. Without enjoying God, okay, Without enjoying God, there is a disconnect in the relationship, thus missing the primary purpose of prayer. It means we have placed focus on ourselves as opposed to Jesus and are expecting or not experiencing the joy that the relationship has to offer. Mm. That's good. We will tend to see God as a, well, here's a word that you guys have heard before, legalistic, mm. to whom we must keep measuring up to and to get what we want. Wow, do you look at God that way? Legalistic. Yeah, a wow. little legalistic. In other words, if you do what I tell you, I'll reward, you know, you know, we measure up to my standard, and if you measure up to my standard, you'll get what you want. Does that really work that way? Mm. Does it? I'm glad it doesn't. Because we there, will never be able to measure up. There's people here that, not here, but there's people here in this world that think that way. Yes. What we do 
doesn't have us increase our favor or our love with God. Do you, you, you understand? It's like God loves us. We cannot measure up. We're all sinners here. Yeah. Right? Remember, unconditionally, without condition. Yeah. So it's must think of it that way, right? Because what is what is the title of our lesson or session today? Prayer for relationship. Okay. We're not if we look at God as legalistic, right? We're not really praying for a relationship there. Okay. Go, go on. It it also means we will be out of sync with the passion, heart, and desires of God. Okay. Our desires will be more influenced by get this now, our sin nature, as opposed to the spirit's nature. Such prayers simply become a means to try to get what we want versus what God wants for us. And that can preach. <laughs> ah. Sure can. When we enjoy God, His desires become our desires, and He eagerly grants those prayers. You see, kind of get the idea of what we're trying to get here. It's like we want to do what you know, he wants us to do willfully. We're like, yes, we want to do because we see what you love and we love what you love. You kind of get the idea. We do that. That's mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's not of you must do this. You know what I'm saying? Not really a good relationship. Is no, it? no. God is not a puppet master. Ah, that's a good one. Number three, without committing our way to the Lord. Ooh. Okay. Without committing our direction to God, we are seeking our own self-driven agenda. I don't even need to expound on that. <laughs> See, our, our agenda doesn't has nothing to do with God's purposes. Okay? The other purpose of prayer is to see God's purpose unfold in this world, right? Self-determined agendas are a form of, there you go, idolatry. Mm. As our lives center around something other than God. I've been called the time. Yeah. Yeah. He will never bless a path different from the one he has prepared for us. <sighs> wow. Hmm. Oh, that's harsh. But true. It is true. I love how it says when we make plans, sometimes that God sets our, our footsteps. God sets our steps in front of us. But I want to I want to go off on a little bit of a tangent here. Oh yeah. Just an illustration. So how many of you like me? And I'll use myself in this. You're sitting at home. You're enjoying your evening. And then all of a sudden you have a sweet tooth. You absolutely love soft baked chocolate chip cookies. I do. So you get up in your house and you run around and you see there's none in your house. But you could get in your car and go to the store, but now you set yourself back 30 minutes or so. And the inconvenience of maybe putting on something decent to wear. Right? So sometimes you're like, you know what? It's not even worth it. It's a cookie. It's a cookie. But sometimes we don't like being inconvenienced. But when we're looking at this praying with relationship, when we have that urge to pray, God is always there. There is no inconvenience there. We can pray in our, in our PJs. We can pray on our couch. Pray in our, in, our, in our bedrooms, in our living room, at our dining room table with our family. But don't let's not inconvenience ourselves. God desires our time. Yes. Sorry to go off on a tangent because that's, I'm... That's good. I was actually thinking about cookies just a second ago. So. <laughs> I like cookies. I like cookies. I like um, It is the season right now about to eat cookies, um, mm -hmm. gallons of milk. But uh, before you start to pray, uh, it might be good to ask yourself, of these three questions. Number one, am I trusting God? Am I trusting God will do what is right and care for me in the process? I almost have to read that again. Are we trusting God will do what is right? That sounds a little dangerous. Mm. Do you believe that God is doing right? Do you think that God cares for you? Well, I, I hope that every time you look at the cross, that should be proof enough God loves us. Right, you know, it goes back to John three sixteen. 
uh, and 17. Don't forget that one. Uh, number two, am I enjoying God? Do you enjoy God? Uh, I, you know, we live in, at least here with us, we live in beautiful Florida. Most of the time we can look outside at the water, at the palm trees, at, at whatever here, the sunshine. And we, we enjoy God's creation. We enjoy the things that God does for us. We enjoy His blessings. Number three, am I following God's path or my own agenda for this day, week, or life? Mm. Mm. You know, even, even as much as I say Aaron and I, we try our best to follow God's will. Sometimes we can even get deviated. Sometimes we have our own plans. You know, we, things happen in life and we, we plan to, I don't know, buy a new house, maybe move or, you know, whatever, find a new job, whatever the case may be. But when we pray, are we trusting God with those things? Hmm. Are we basing it on what we want or what God wants for our life? And again, God has your best interest in heart. Why not stop, start there? So as we look at this, as we continue, we know that Jesus enjoyed relationship with the Father. And because he did, he was in a position to hear the Father's will for his life. So even though uh, Jesus was God in the flesh, how awesome is it that even he still took the time to pray to seek God's will? Even as the Son of Man, a Son of God, he still sought guidance from from God. He still asked for courage. He still asked for strength. He still asked, "What what is your will, God?" And I'll do it. Can we pray like that? Can we pray, God, what is your will, and I'll follow it. I'll trust it. That's having a strong prayer life. If we can pray like that. So now let's turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 12. We're going to look at verse 49 and 50. Uh, that's, that's a long chapter. And it reads, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal, a life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. Mm. Now, if that ain't trust, I don't know what is. Yeah. And also, you see uh, even a hint of obedience there. Wouldn't it be amazing to hear from the Father what we should say and how we should say it? Mm. <laughs> yes, that would be amazing. That would be amazing. <laughs> when do you think Jesus heard all this from the Father? Hmm. Okay, so... Jesus relied on prayer, you know, the same way that we do today. Mm -hmm. okay. He spent time with the Father and as a result was able to discern his voice. That was a good one. Yeah. So he got away to quiet places so that he, or so that the Father, the voices, the voice of the Father would not be drowned out by chaos and noise and he could focus on their relationship. Mm. So yes, it may be a good thing to turn off your news before you pray. <laughs> yes. You don't want to be distracted by the chaos. That's true. Yeah. So Jesus also knew he was fully dependent on the Father to lead him and empower him to do what he wanted done on earth. Mm -hmm. So John 5, verse 19. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of His own accord, but only what He sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son, that the Son does likewise. So, what do we mean when we say Jesus was dependent on the Father? That's a pretty interesting question. It is. Okay. Though, you know, Jesus was fully God. He was also fully man. And therefore, he was dependent on the Father for life and direction. Okay, just like we are today. Mm -hmm. Everything Jesus did was directed and empowered by the Father and the Holy Spirit. As a result, he did nothing apart from the leading of the Father and the Holy Spirit. It means he did not set his own agenda, whatever you know, whatever people may think. You know, he didn't. He did what the Father told him. But he met with the Father each day to enjoy his presence, number one, to hear his voice, number two, be empowered and directed by the Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm. 
So as we look at Jesus's relationship with his father, just as we should reflect that same relationship, why do we tend to operate independently of God? It might be a, an easy question to ask because a lot of times we do. You know, I, I've, I've heard us, uh, people say that we live in an I generation. Not meaning that everyone has an iPhone or an iPad or whatever, but meaning that we focus on I before we focus on anyone else. So even when things, uh, problems arise, even in your own household, we tend to want to try to fix it ourselves. Yep. But why should we not start with God? God, how can, how can I better myself in this? How, how can you direct me? Hmm. So we must rely on God. So Jesus expresses the true nature of godly dependence. So now we want to turn our attention back over to John chapter 15. We're going to read verse 1 through 11. And uh, just pay attention to the words here as we'll have them on the screen for you. And it reads, and this is Jesus speaking, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Each branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he uh, it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. There's a lot in there. There's a lot That's in there. That's a lot. Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, well, let's kind of, I mean, there's a lot in there to break down, but let's just talk about one, you know, in or cons or their idea of what we're talking about today what does jesus mean when he says abide in me and i in you well to abide in jesus means that we need to draw near to jesus in a loving relationship and submit to everything he calls us to do mm -hmm. yep. complete lordship complete obedience wow if we love jesus and obey everything he commands then we will experience His presence, His Spirit's leading, and effectiveness in our life. Wow, that's a pretty, sounds like pretty bold statement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all about the relationship, okay? Notice in those verses that Tim just read, 9 through 11, the result of abiding in Jesus is to experience the love of God in our life and full joy that accompanies with that. Yes. God doesn't want us to obey him so that he gets more things done. I think we talked about it before. He doesn't need us for yeah, anything. That's what I was going to say. I was like, hey, look, <laughs> shocker. Shocker. <laughs> he doesn't need us to do anything. He wants us to love and obey him so that our lives will be full of his joy. Amen to that. Yeah. That's good. Right. How will this type of relationship affect our prayers then? If we are abiding in Christ and being obedient to his leading, then our prayers become very impacting. In fact, whatever we ask will be granted to us. See, there's a lot of people, you want to talk about tangent. There's a lot of people that, you know, kind of, I would say, use some of these verses wrong. Would you, you say that, Tim, you know, when you're talking about whatever you ask, yeah, taken out of context. Yeah, they'll take this so out of context. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever you wish, it'll be done for you. Oh, Father, I wish for a brand new Porsche. I don't know if that's necessarily what he's talking about. Okay. But if we're in his will, 
and we ask him for things, it will be granted to us. Yes, it's in his will, yes. That's what we have to be aware of. And what do we know? How do we know what's in his will? That's what we're discussing. We seek it. There you go. If we seek it, he's going to reveal it to us. Right. Just like as he did with Jesus. So why is this so? <laughs> when we are that closely connected to Jesus Christ, his Holy Spirit directs our thoughts and our desires, hello, in such a way that they align with the Father. This is exactly what Jesus experienced. As he met with the Father, he learned to be led by the Holy Spirit in everything he said and did. As a result, whatever Jesus requested, the Father answered, and Jesus bore much fruit. Would, would you agree to that? Uh, he bore a lot of fruit. That's good. So, just as a few things that we've already discussed in this session, there are the keys to effective prayer, and we're going to have them here on the screen for you. So number one, we're going back to what we saw in the psalm, trusting God. So we trust God, trusting God will always provide for you and always do what is right. Number two, enjoying God. So we focus on our relationship with Christ as we pray. And number three, committing your day to God. Obey Him in whatever He asks you to do. So think about it. As soon as you roll out of bed, why don't you pray, even if it's a five-second prayer? God, be with me. Give me the strength. Guide me. Lead me. I've known evangelists to pray that every single morning. He would say, guide those who need to be in my path so that I can share the gospel with. That's a way to pray. But asking God, commit your day to God. How awesome would that be? So as we wrap up here, prayer is not about getting what you want. Absolutely not. Really? <laughs> I don't know. Some people do pray for portions and have I don't know. I mean, I don't know. But prayer is about enjoying God and seeking His leading. Again, as our Heavenly Father, He, he wants to hear from His children. And we should also hear uh, His guidance as our Father. So, last question here. How can you schedule your life in such a way to make your relationship with God a priority? Hmm. Now, I know I mentioned a little bit earlier, sometimes we have such busy schedules that the time that we give God is usually whatever's left over. Say, so, you know, I work eight hours a day. I go home. I, I deserve three hours break. Um, I need to take an hour to do this. And then maybe I got six minutes before I hit the bed and start all over again. Why don't we prioritize God first and then everything else? If we can trust Him on our finances that way, why should we not trust Him on prayer that way? I hope that makes sense. That's good. It makes a lot of sense. <laughs> and, and it's convicting for a lot of people because that's hard. It is hard. And it can be hard for me. I'll well, be honest with that. And that's why we're talking about spiritual disciplines. It is a spiritual discipline. Yep. We must intentionally seek to set out time for God. As He has set us apart, we should set apart time in our schedule. Well, that's a good thing. That's actually that's really good. I like that. All right, so that's the end of this particular uh, session, you know, as far as like the teaching part of it. Now we're going to talk about our devotionals for the week. We're not going to talk about it too much, but we are going to talk about learning the books of the Bible of the New Testament. You guys got the Old Testament down yet? <laughs> hmm? Well, now we're going to talk about the first five books of the Bible of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. You guys know what those are? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. I think a lot of people would get that one right. I don't know about the Acts part, but people would get Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, Matthew. Let's talk about Matthew a little bit. Quick, Matthew writes to a Jew Jewish audience to show them that Jesus fulfills the Old Testament prophecies regarding the promised king. Note how the gene genealogy in Matthew 1 centers around King David and that Jesus is legal heir to the throne. Amen. That's, that's very true. Mark. Mark written to a Jewish audience where? In Rome. Mark only includes information that speaks to that crowd. 
He sets out to show that Jesus' accomplishments, miracles, and teachings authenticate him as the true Son of God. Luke, right? Luke's goal is to set the record straight concerning the accurate history of Jesus. That's good. He writes, yeah. He writes primarily to a Greek audience, emphasizing the humanity of Christ as the second Adam. Salvation is available to all people, not just the Jews. Note how his genealogy traces right back to Adam, the son of God. Ooh. The title, Son of Man, is used frequently of Christ. Mm -hmm. okay. John states his purpose for writing in John 20, 30-32. Okay, that's when John states his purpose, right? To show that Jesus is what? The Son of God and that by believing in Him you can have eternal life. John uses much imagery from Genesis, Exodus, to show how Jesus is initiating a new creation in a new Exodus. Mm. All right, the book of Acts. Okay, also written by Luke. This book continues the historical account after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus and how the Holy Spirit builds the church and launches the gospel of the nations. Look. After the resurrection, it gives a more, the ascension of Jesus Christ is awesome because if you make a note how he comes up, he comes right back. He comes right back in the same way. Angels state that. Pretty Acts, cool. Acts chapter one verse eight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. So we look at these the gospels in the Acts. So I hope you guys uh, maybe that's a good step in the New Testament. Um, trying to memorize the books here. Um, Quick, quick question for you. See if you get this right. How many books are in the New Testament? We'll reveal that one later. Um, actually, I'll go ahead. 27. Yeah, There's yeah, 27. 27. <laughs> <laughs> but we just want to thank you again for joining us as we talk about a prayer, a praying with a forward relationship. Some of you might have thought we we're maybe we're trying to help you pray for a future relationship with a husband or wife. I don't know. But uh, we, we focused on how we can have a, build a relationship with God first. So um, I hope you enjoyed this time with us as we looked at scripture, we looked at Christ, uh, trusting and, and, and following God's leading, seeking after his will. If we are to be Christians, then we have to be more Christ-like. So if Jesus took time to set aside to seek the Father, how much more should we be doing that? He was the Son of God. And if he emphasized prayer, even alone, even while people are sleeping, how much more should we? Are we willing to sacrifice 30 minutes or an hour every day to pray. I think God would love that and He's going to bless that. So continue with us as we uh, dig a little bit deeper into the theology because it looks like we even talked a little bit about that today. Um, and we love you and we're, we're going to keep praying for you. Anything you'd like to add, sir? No, that's good. Keep on praying for that relationship. The more you go for it and the more, you know, the more things you do to help that relationship, yes. the better it gets. And quick side note, I don't want to leave this out. We'll have here up on the screen the next five days of devotions. We don't want you to really sidetrack from that. We want to stay uh, plugged in to God's Word. God's going to use that to build us up, to grow us, to teach us. Uh, His Word is a living Word. It's active. So why should we not be in His Word every day? So we're going to pray that you continue in your devotions. So until next time, we love you, and we're going to keep praying for you.